So, how big is the universe? To give you the truth, we don't actually know. Since as long as humanity can remember, we have stared out into the night sky and asked ourselves that very question. Every discovery we've made, every technological, mathematical, philosophical breakthrough has brought us closer to the truth and yet further fueled our imagination of what might lie beyond. Whether you believe it to be an act of creation or simply an eventuality, the astonishing scale and beauty of the universe has been somewhat of a progressive discovery. And that is what we're here to discuss today, how we discovered the universe. Although we now think of the universe as incredibly large, it was not always the case. There was a time when humanity thought that the Earth was a circle floating in a giant ocean, a cosmic ocean. In 3rd century BCE, the great mathematician, physicist and astronomer Archimedes formulated that this cosmic ocean was around two light years in diameter. To us, this seems like a small number, but back then it was larger than anyone had previously imagined so much so that you had to invent a system for naming large numbers. The number system of that time could only express numbers up to a myriad, which was 10,000. But Archimedes designed a way of expressing numbers much larger than that, using orders of magnitude, very similar to how we now write 1 million as 10 to the power 6. In doing so, he developed a new way to explore bigger distances and bigger maths, which would help set the future for astronomy. Fast forward to the 16th century, around 1500 years after Archimedes, and this is when our concept of the universe really started to change. The 16th century marked the creation of the telescope, which was arguably the single largest, most important technological invention humanity has ever had in its voyage of interstellar exploration. Almost overnight, these faint twinkling little lights that people had stared at for millennia became something real, something palpable. Suddenly, blurs became nebulas, lights became stars, and humanity's dreams became reality. For the first time ever, we were able to visit the stars. The invention of the telescope brought a wave of discovery along with immense interest from many of the top mathematicians, physicists and aristocrats of the time. Astronomy was no longer a philosophical conversation, but a real science, one which could be observed, measured and studied. Over the next 250 years, discoveries were quickly made. There was a seventh and even eighth planet discovered, Uranus and Neptune, which sat beyond Saturn, which was considered to be the furthest known planet at the time. Galileo Galilei also noted that the bright band on the sky, known as the Milky Way, was actually composed of many, many faint stars. By 1850, William Parsons completes the world's first great telescope. Known as the Leviathan of Parsonstown, this telescope had a huge 180 centimetre mirror that dwarfed all of the telescopes of its era. Using this telescope, he observed a nebula with an unusual spiral nature. This nebula, known as Messier 51, M51, or what it would later be known as the Whirlpool Galaxy, was one of the key discoveries that made astronomers question the nature of the universe. You see, up until that point, our universe was the Milky Way galaxy, a rotating disk made up of billions of stars spanning a diameter of 100 to 200,000 light years. There was nothing outside the Milky Way. This was it. Until the 1900s, this was the size of our universe. The thing was, there were some peculiarities. For example, nebulae which existed throughout the sky and were assumed to be unresolved groups of stars or large collections of gas seemed to have unusual shapes and properties 
such as the spiral nebula William Parsons had spotted in 1850. One man, Emmanuel Kent, had suggested that these nebulae were actually very distant galaxies, independent of our own. He called these island universes. But his theories went largely dismissed, because the distances involved were just inconceivable. However, in 1917, Heber Curtis observed a supernova in the Great Andromeda Nebula, and searching through photographic records, he found 11 more. What Curtis noticed was these novae were on average 10 times fainter than those that occurred across the rest of the sky. Why was that? The faintness of those stars implied a distance of around 150,000 parsecs, which is around half a million light years away. This theory rippled through the world of astronomy, because if true, it would mean that the universe just became a hell of a lot bigger than was previously assumed. In 1920, Curtis had the chance to argue his theories against his fellow Harvard-based astronomer Harlow Shapley in the Smithsonian Museum of National History in what is known as the Great Debate. Shapley argued that Andromeda could not be a galaxy because if it was, the relative size compared to our own Milky Way would put it in the region of millions of light years away. And also these novae that were being witnessed were outshining the light from an entire galaxy. This seemed unfathomable and it was simply outright rejected by most. One of Curtis's simple but incredibly effective counter arguments was that there were more novae in Andromeda than the entire rest of the Milky Way combined. How could this be? The only way is that this nebula was actually a galaxy equal to or potentially larger than the Milky Way. And just given the relative sizes, it was probably millions of light years away. Well, a few years later, in 1923, Edwin Hubble proved Andromeda was indeed a galaxy. The way he did this is quite interesting. He used a concept known as a standard candle. Let's imagine we want to know the distance of a star. Well, if we know its true luminosity, as in how bright it would be right in front of us, then by using the inverse square law, we could calculate the distance away. This correlation between the luminosity of light and the distance is well established across space. This is why you could call it a standard or a standard candle. Hubble used a type of pulsating star known as a sea feed variable as standard candles buried within Andromeda. These unusual pulsating stars had luminosities far fainter in the Andromeda galaxy and Hubble was able to calculate their distance to be around 900,000 light years away. Shapley later agreed that the evidence was sound and genuine when Hubble sent him a letter in 1924 concluding his research. Shapley famously quoted this was the letter that destroyed my universe. But this was far from a destruction. This was an explosion. The universe had just gone from being 100,000 light years in diameter to 1 million. But things were only just beginning. In 1990, NASA launched the Hubble Space Telescope. After almost 400 years of gradual developments, this was the pinnacle of telescope technology. A bus-sized telescope with a generous 2.4 meter mirror designed to orbit the Earth and operate entirely from space. You see, the atmosphere was one of the greatest obstacles for distant universe observation. After traveling millions or billions of years across the universe, these tiny packets of photons from distant stars would strike the Earth's atmosphere only to be distorted and maimed in the final moments before reaching our telescopes. In doing so, it would leave us with ever more blurry images the further we tried to look into space. But no longer. 
Hubble presented an opportunity to observe the universe clearer than ever before. Free of the shackles and restraints the Earth's atmosphere had held over us, and the results were spectacular. In 1995, Hubble was pointed at a dark patch of the sky for 10 days. The area selected was incredibly small, around a pinhead size, held at arm's length, and there was next to no light there, it was almost entirely black. No one was quite sure what to expect, but what came next has undoubtedly become the most breathtaking photo ever taken by any telescope. Known as the Hubble Deep Field Photo, this tiny patch of sky, this minute, almost insignificant patch of darkness, held a kaleidoscope of hidden galaxies. Thousands upon thousands of galaxies tucked away, completely hidden, because their distances were so unimaginably great that the light had been too weak to be picked up by anything on Earth. The implications of this one photo sent the astronomical world into frenzy. The amount of galaxies in this one small section of sky implied there must be hundreds of billions of galaxies in the universe. All of a sudden, there were more stars in the universe than there were grains of sand in all the beaches of the world combined. In later developments, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field and Extreme Deep Field photographs were generated the 2012 extreme deep field image represented a total exposure time of 2 million seconds, or around 23 days of exposure over 10 years. The most distant galaxies in this photo had an age of around 13.2 billion years. And although you might be wise to assume that it would mean the universe was 13.2 billion light years wide, you would be incorrect. And here's why. As we looked at galaxies further and further into the distance, we noticed something odd. The light coming from those galaxies seemed more red the further they were from us. What did that mean? Well, light is a spectrum that comes in a variety of wavelengths. Natural light, the light we can see, is only a small part of that spectrum. It's around 400 to 700 nanometers in length. As wavelengths become shorter, they become increasingly more blue or violet. But as they become longer, they become increasingly more red, or red-shifted, such as the distant galaxies Hubble was observing. But what causes wavelengths to become longer? Well, one reason is movement. The Doppler effect is when a wave is stretched as the source moves away from the observer. As galaxies we observe begin to move away from us, their light becomes stretched longer and appears red-shifted. This is what we notice the majority of galaxies doing in the universe around us. They are moving away from us, at great speed. In fact, the degree of redshift we were seeing in the most distant galaxies tells us they are moving faster than the speed of light. But how? How can these distant galaxies be breaking the cosmic speed limit as defined by Einstein? Nothing can break the speed limit, can it? Well, technically yes. And no. You see, nothing can travel through space faster than light, but there's no actual physical law to say that space itself cannot expand faster than light, or that two relative points in space can't be moving away from each other faster than light due to the space in between expanding. Although this expansion is infinitesimally small in any one area of local space, for example, between the Earth and the Sun, when you consider billions of light years of empty space, the effect can soon add up. For every 3.26 million light years away, space expands 70 kilometers a second. We call this Hubble flow, or the Hubble constant. 
And at 500 million light years away, space is expanding at roughly one Earth width every second. If we keep going further and further away, we eventually reach a distance where the combined expansion between this point in the universe and us is equal to the speed of light. At this point, the light emitted from those galaxies is no longer able to reach us, like a cosmic conveyor belt which is pushing the light away faster than it can reach us. We call this the cosmic horizon. Beyond this point, the laws of physics prevent us from seeing what is there. This becomes the limit of our visible universe, also known as the observable universe. But how far is this distance? Well, due to the expansion of the universe, it is not as simple as multiplying the age of the universe with the speed of light. We have to factor the 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec, Hubble constant. By doing this, we get an estimate around three times larger, around 93 billion light years in diameter. So there we have it. That's how we discovered the universe. Sorry, did I say universe? I meant the observable universe. Like I said at the beginning, we don't actually know the full size of all the universe, including the bit we cannot see. We simply know the size of the bit we can see. But yeah, maybe we'll leave that for another video. I hope you enjoyed watching, and if you did, please let YouTube know by giving this video a like, comment, or sharing it with one of your friends. The more you guys interact with my video, the more likely YouTube will suggest it to other people that enjoy the same videos as you do. It really helps support my channel. Until next time, peace.